Okay, everybody, I've got top of the hour. Welcome to our virtual Thursday. Uh, today's topic is going to be the new apparatus narratives, as well as some nuances and, and going over some nuances and some changes, updates to the Enfers reporting. Before we get started, got to tell you a little bit about Academy in Miami. So here's uh, one of the pictures from uh, participants in Miami. We are having a good time last, uh, last week. There's the group shot, nice hotel. Or, uh, Nicole called this the crayon building behind us. Thought it'd make a nice backdrop for the uh, group photo for the Miami event. And just so you know, it wasn't all business. We did a little relaxing out by the pool. So all in all, a good event. And I do notice that uh, John Longacre was at the event, so, and he's on with us today for the Virtual Thursday. So John, hello, glad to see you again. A um, lot of familiar names, Mike Nestledge. Nancy Shane, Paul Wind, hey Paul, uh, Roger Parker, a lot of, lot of familiar names here. So guys, I'm glad you're able to join us today. Okay, and so just so you know, we have the first two events planned for 2018. First one, we're going to do eight of these next year. So the first one's going to be January 16th through the 18th in Orlando. So bring the kids out for a little Disney World trip. And then uh, closer to my neck of the woods in uh, Phoenix and Scottsdale on February 6th through the 8th. And we'll be announcing more of these um, as we get closer to the end of the year. But those are our first two for 2018. Okay, let's get into today's topics. All right, first thing I want to mention right out of the gate, and you guys may have noticed this, if you've tried to access our support page, um, you now have to have a login for it. And the reason for that is that we had like 7,000 community posts that were just basically just spam. And so to kind of lock that down a little bit and to make the whole experience better for everyone, um, you need to have um, an, a username and password that does not have to be the same as your emergency reporting login and password. In fact, I'd probably recommend it not be the same. Uh, but when you click, um, I'm already logged in, so I can't directly demonstrate it, but you'll see that when you go to the support page, it's going to prompt you for a login and a password to access the support pages. And we just posted this, I think it was posted previously too, but we reposted it again just to give everybody a heads up so they're not like surprised, like how come it's locked down? Um, it's not locked down, it's just to make it a better experience so we don't get hit with just um, nonsense posts or just random posts into the uh, into the knowledge base and into the uh, user voice. So I wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. Don't forget to, by clicking on support or either one of these links that are in the in-system announcements, and I know you guys have done this for Virtual Thursday, most of you registered through this link or through the login page link, you've got your history of system updates here as well, and we've got over two years worth of announcements, and not that you're gonna go back and review all of these uh, for sure, uh, but certainly uh, the power users are staying up to date when you can go and read what we deployed on Tuesday. There's a full summary of the changes made to the system. So to definitely, those of you I know taking the time to join us today, you're clearly power users. Um, definitely look, especially in your area of responsibility, changes that have been made. For example, if you're responsible for maintenance, you can see we, we fixed the equipment grid's delete category modal so that it does not stay open after deletion. That was driving me absolutely nuts because it, it was you could see behind the modal page, the pop-up window basically, that it was making the changes, but it wouldn't clear that modal. Uh, and so you'd have to refresh the page. It did what it, you wanted it to do, but it just wouldn't give you back the main page. And so that's been fixed. So little things like that, this is where we keep you up to date on it. Okay, we're gonna go straight to incidents. And the number one topic of today, uh, today's uh, training covers the new incidents in the system, the new incident narratives for apparatus. And I had an, uh, one started here, there it is. Okay, so we're gonna go through a lot of other things here in basic, in the basic module, but I wanna go straight here to the main narrative so everybody understands um, what we're offering now and how it differs from before and then some settings in admin that you all need to be aware of. And before I go any further, I need to introduce my wingman, Alan Miller. Um, one of our regional trainers based out of sunny 
Dayton, Ohio area. Um, Alan, everything's still working on my audio. Can you hear me okay, buddy? Yep, you sound good. All right. So he's going to be here to answer questions and also to take you through some of the changes with the EPCR because he was our lead trainer on recent uh, virtual Thursdays, of which they're all they're all been posted onto our webinar uh, webinars on demand via the knowledge base. But he was the lead trainer on those uh, past couple uh, uh, virtual Thursdays, so his expertise will be very welcome here today. Just check, and uh, he'll keep me aware if we've got any questions coming into. Okay, looking good. So first place, and I'm going to show you the settings momentarily, but we're going to go right to, right straight to the narrative. And this whole page kind of has a, a new feel from the old narrative page. So it is pretty straightforward. Uh, you can add a narrative. I wish it's a really great feature, and it's not real complicated, but uh, there's a few things I want to show you. Um, the author now, uh, the author should auto-populate. Um, with you, you can see behind here, it started the narrative and it auto-populated. It could be because I'm zoomed out that it's not appearing there. You can title the narrative, so if this is Engine 1, Captain, you can select your apparatus. And a question we've, we've gotten from some of our customers is that, well, why doesn't it just show the apparatus that were on the scene? And the product owner for this explained to me that the reason for it is, is in the event that, say, someone who wasn't necessarily on the primary incident, but say an investigator has to go back in and add his notes, that gives them the ability to do it. And, and fortunately, with the new functionality that you can reduce this list to only apparatus in your agency versus those that have to document mutual aid apparatus as well, um, you can reduce it to where it just shows um, those apparatus um, four incidents, and it will show, excuse me, it'll show uh, mutual aid units here too, but the nice thing is, is you can quickly filter by just even one character into the filter field there, and it will give you a, a quick pick list of the ones that you uh, that you can choose from. We've got the, uh, the WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, little HTML um, editor here, so now uh, we can thank um, Allegheny County, Pennsylvania for this one. Um, they needed it for their reports um, for fire investigation. And so you can now bold, italicize, underline, and even bullet your uh, incident narrative. And then don't forget here too, um, control, command or con control Z if you're on a Windows machine, command Z if you're on a Mac to undo, and then uh, control shift Z to redo. So that's for motor vehicle collision. On arrival, and then of course, all of the editors here, just like you would in a word processor. So, piece of cake, um, very very straightforward. And then of course, it auto saves as you go. It tells you when the time and, and date that it was last saved, and you'll see little uh, notifications pop up as you're typing. So we'll do this. And you can see the timestamp will change as you're going through the seconds. So about every 20 seconds it's going to be saving. And then you've got your narrative. And then the other narratives for the other units can be added here as well. They can be edited. Okay. And then they can also be deleted. Now, I'm in as a full administrator here. If, uh, as a submitter, uh, I will, I think you can delete your own, and I can even change my permission settings, but correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, I believe that you can delete your own narrative, but you cannot delete others' narratives. Yeah, that's the way I understand it, for sure. Okay, so the addition of these narratives are pretty straightforward, um, but the key that you need to look at here is in the administration module, You now have under incident settings, there's a new tool to allow you to change your incident narrative settings parameters. So one is the narrative is not required. So what that means is a person can go in and complete an ENFRS report without having to put in a narrative. 
That's if you select this one. If you select the second option, all incident exposures, okay, an exposure in Enfer's jargon is the initial fire, which is exposure zero, and then spread to any other structure and or mobile property would become exposures one, two, and so forth. And that just means that you have to have at least one narrative for every apparatus. And so what that means is if there are four apparatus on the scene, the, the incident cannot be completed until there is a narrative for each apparatus on that scene. And then the third option is all incident exposures must have at least one non-CAD narrative. So what this means is your CAD, if you have a, if you have a CAD link with us, your CAD can push the narrative out, push a narrative from the CAD out. That becomes a, like it was in the previous narrative uh, page, it is a read-only narrative. Okay, but that, if you select this third one, that narrative on the narrative page that is automatically populated by the CAD does not count towards completion of that report. You still have to put in at least one manually entered narrative for that incident, and that's what that third choice is. I'm going to take a quick pause because I see a question came through from Chris. Oh, yep, I was getting ready to... So will the narrative maker's name, so the report writer's name, be included on the line next to the last save time similar to the EPCR narrative. So let's go take a look, we'll take a look at that momentarily. Um, any questions on these three settings? And again, I'm not sure if everybody on the line has administrative privileges, but these are the three choices now with the new narrative. Just keep in mind that that doesn't mean that you don't can't put a narrative in on this first one, it just means that you could still complete the report with no narrative. The third one, for those of you that do not require a narrative for each apparatus, I recommend this third one. Alan, any comments from your end or your department on this one? No, that's uh, that's pretty much where we fall in line. We use the uh, at least one non-CAD narrative selection. Awesome. Okay, let's go back to that incident. And let me see if I can understand and answer uh, Chris's question. So Chris, once the narrative has been added, it will show the author apparatus in these columns here. Uh, is that is that what you were asking? Is is like if I were to go add another narrative now? Of course, I'm. It's still me. But if if Alan were logged in and doing this one, um, he could put in another narrative, and it would show his name. as the well, author here. Here. Yeah, if you want to put one in, that way we can show them we'll be working across the country here and adding different narratives. Let me go ahead and clear one of these out. Actually, two of them. That way it would be more like a real incident. And so if I'm working and cranking out a narrative or just finished mine, um, Alan can then go in and it's you got the incident number, Alan? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And so while Alan's doing that, I got a question for everybody. So um, there's, you're going to be seeing over the months ahead, the years ahead, um, changes and refinements to the whole infers and uh, reporting process. Because those of you that have either first PCR or Nemesis 3, you know that the user interface is a little different. It, it's more like this. So just maybe throw some comments as to how, what you think about you know the new or newer. Uh, user interface with the chunkier buttons and different colors and setup here and uh, the arrangement uh, from a customer perspective. We're just kind of curious, knowing that you know the old and I say old, the legacy way, you know, of these pages for now will stay in 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 place. But this is kind of a preview of where we're heading with the user interface. What do you guys think about that? And okay, so there's Alan's narrative. And so it appears like this, stacked um, as they were entered, okay. And there's not filters to um, or sort sortability here. It's it's uh, stacked as they're entered into the incident report itself. And then that's the one he just entered from Ohio, and I entered mine from Arizona. Does that answer your question, uh, question, Chris?
Oh, cool. Also, okay. Tom, you can yeah. see there, I, I edited yours because I have rights to edit yours, obviously. But I edited yours, and it does not change the author. So the initial author is going to be the is going to remain the author on that page. Oh, excellent point. Thank you, Alan. Excellent point. Yep. So I could go in and edit Alan's. And he's still the original author. Nancy, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the comments. So on the user interface, knowing that this is kind of a different looking page than the others, um, users like the new interface, except for those who are colorblind, yes. Prefer a way to indicate fields in a way other than red alone, making required fields bold or add, yes. So adding an asterisk. Um, or I like um, on Inspect DR we've got different icons that are also color coded for those that aren't color one can see the green or red, but also they're a different shape. So in other words, moving forward, what, he, what she's saying, it'd be nice to have instead of red green, just red green, to have different shaped icons as well to show you that it's green or red or you know good to go or, or needs attention. So great feedback. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, so that's the new narrative. Um, not real complex, but it is a really neat tool. The other thing that I want to show you about the narrative is this one. How it appears in the printable form. Because that's always a big deal, especially if you get uh, a, requ a request for information uh, or you know, legal requests. So what does this, what will it look like if you have to share this document? I'm going to go into the, do into the report. Of course, pr click the print icon. Um, we'll check all, we'll skip the PCR, and we'll go with personnel. And so how that new narrative stacks up is right here. Okay, so all of the ENFERS information is up at the top, and then you've got the different narratives listed here. And I already know what someone's probably going to ask, but I'll wait for it to be asked for a minute and see if... Uh, if it gets asked, um, looking based on what you're seeing here. And I'm going to take John Novak's got a question. Are departments using this for their formal fire investigation reports, including arson fires, as part of a fire investigation bureau? So, John, what they're doing, the, the one I had mentioned earlier is Allegheny County. They're actually using their, their own, their investigation division is using this um, as part of their um, investigation. Um, fire investigation reporting, and they're not actually sharing it with the fire department in the sense that it's also for ENFERS and, and the, the broader fire department's using it as well. But if you're wondering if there's a demand for just uh, an investigation module above and beyond the ENFERS investigation module that would be accessible only to investigators, that has been um, frequently discussed um, on, on our end and is something we're looking at doing. So. I know some departments may use this for their investigation um, and tie it directly to the incident that is completed by the fire crews, the operations side of the house. Uh, but I do know that, that there's also the concerns of accessibility to this because those are that's investigative inf information and it doesn't really provide a way to uh, reduce access to that even in a read-only format. So that's a bit of a bit of a concern for the investigation divisions. So very, very, very good question, um, and it will help uh, help propel us towards um, an investigation, independent invest investigation module tied to the incident report, but accessible only by individuals. And that'll that kind of that um, feature coupled with the granular permissions coming forward in um, the administration module will help make that happen um, in the longer term. So one thing I want to address here, and I want to get your feedback on this, everybody. Um, thank you, Chris. Yeah. I was That's what I was waiting for. All right, so Chris's, Chris's question was, the incident narratives on the print page do not identify the author, and, unit, the, and he's asking why. Well, I can tell you I don't have an answer as to why. However, if I'm a company officer or chief officer, I kind of want that here. So um, I'm going to grab it and, and talk to the product owner. And we're just going to grab a quick screenshot. Screenshot. I'm sure this has been brought up before, but I'll bring it up again. Uh, have you noticed this too, Alan? 
Yeah, it's something I've noticed that I I think it's definitely important. Obviously, if you're printing it off for an attorney or something, they're going to want to know who uh, who authored each narrative. So let me ask you guys this: um, If we did incident narrative dash first to dash author dash unit, would that be sufficient there, or would there be anything else you'd like to see? And I'm thinking put it in the blue header here. What do you guys think? And just just put a quick chat in the question. Um, and if you have another idea, let us know too, because this is an opportunity for you to tell us what you need out there. I mean, I, Alan and I have one idea, and you guys probably have a better idea. So that's kind of where I was thinking. I think a timestamp would be even good too. Timestamp? Okay. Well, the last edited or the first started, right? Yeah, probably. I mean, probably. Well, yeah. So there's some opportunities here. So I'm glad I, I'm glad I went there, and you guys, your feedback's great. So Mike. Oh, I got a shout, shout out. Michael Bozzoni must have joined us. Mike's one of our trainers too. Um, in fact, Mike, give me a second here, buddy. I'm going to promote you. So in case you want to chime in, you can chime in and make sure there's nobody else from our our team on here. Give me one second here. Yep, it's not going to let me promote you. That's okay. Um, oddly enough, it's not letting me promote you. I think once the session's in play. Um, also, hello to Andy Olison um, from Iowa City. Nope, take that back. Cedar Rapids, um, and in Iowa, and uh, he was out at the National Training Academy back in uh, when was it now? September. Wow, time flies. Okay, let me close this out. Great guys, thanks for your feedback on this. Very, very helpful. Yeah, Paul, Paul had a good point there. In the meantime, you can write your name in the narrative, and that. That would uh, be a good way to designate who wrote it out. Brother Wind. Leave it to Brother Wind. All right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and that's kind of what I did in our old narratives um, in my department was, I, if, especially before, before we had independent narratives, I would just go in and if I had to append it, I'd put in appended by... And then... I could, you know, engine and do it like that, and that would appear in the narrative. So, as an as an inter, uh, can't even talk today. As a temporary, <laughs> as a temporary workaround, that's that's a great solution from uh, Paul out of Picatinny Arsenal. Oh yes, Andy Andy Olson is famous. So if you go to our login page, I got to throw this out there, Andy. I know I'm going to embarrass you. But if you go out to uh, our login page, uh, that picture of the person on the schooner that we were on during the National Training Academy, that's Andy. And he is a power user extraordinaire out in Iowa. So um, that's the guy. Okay, so next up, we're going to go basic here. I just want to walk you through some of the things that have changed. And maybe not dramatically, but just some new things that you need to keep in mind um, uh, when your document in an NFRS report that many of you may know, but I'd still like to bring it up. It's always like a good good refresher. Uh, so first off, this whole eight given and received business causes a lot of confusion when we're out there on site training. And so bottom line is uh, NFRS, if you give automatic aid or give mutual aid, NFRS wants three things. And if we were in the classroom, I would ask you guys, what are those three things? But you're all probably shouting it out right now. So we need the FDID of the agency you gave aid to, we need the state, and we need the incident number. So two out of three of those things are really easy to get typically, and I'll show you when we get to another page um, how easy it is to have that. The challenging thing is, is that incident number. Sometimes you can just call the dispatch center because that same dispatch center dispatches for them as well as you. Other times it's a volunteer agency and they may not get to the report right away. And especially if you're agency friends, and when I say agency friends, that means that you're both ER customers, and if you give aid to another ER customer that has selected aid received on their incident, okay, it will appear on a drop-down list from which you can pick that incident, and it will automatically fill those three fields, FDID, state, and incident number. So that's a beautiful thing for departments that are both on emergency reporting, one gives aid, the other selects they received aid, and that's done for you from an NFIRST perspective. 
However, if you don't have that luxury, you're going to need to have those, those elements of data before you can submit to Enforce. And so the challenging one is always getting that incident number. So we'll get there momentarily, but I'm going to select that aid, mutual aid was given. So when we get to page five of the report, I'll show you what needs to happen. Okay, basic two. Um, that really has not changed, and we went simple here. I'm not going to do a full-blown fire report. Just know if you have um, e EMS uh, module as well as the fire uh, component to our system, fire and EMS package, when you select yes, it opens up the uh, EMS pages to where you can add patients. And that was the subject of the last three virtual Thursdays with, with Alan and, and Mark and myself. Okay, so what you might notice differently here is you can use an incident facility or location name. So in the event that this is your pickup location for patient care and or it's the location where an incident took place, all right, you can document that very quickly just like you could with the use occupancy address. So if I use occupancy address, I can pick an occupancy there's a lot of bad things that keep happening at the Archer Ale House here. Whoops. Not by ID, but by name. Okay, so I can use that and it will auto-fill all of these fields for me with one click. The same can take place when I click remove. I'm removing the, it removes the link to the occupancy module. Okay, so the link to the occupancy module is good because there's a filter on the advanced search that you can use that many of you may have looked at, and I'll, I'll take a, a quick peek there after this to show you what I'm talking about. Um, and that's the only time that filter applies on advanced search is if you click use occupancy address. It won't matter that you put in the right address. You've got to actually pull it from the occupancy module for that filter to work. So I'll just go ahead and actually do this one instead. Um, back in your settings for destinations in the administration module, you can build your destinations list. And so let's say, in this case, it was a pickup or an incident at UMC. I click Use, and it auto-fills it just like if you were using the occupancy address. Okay? Pretty easy, pretty basic, and again, if you have a CAD interface, the CAD will probably populate all of this, but that doesn't preclude a report writer from choosing either one of these. And then just quickly to show you what I'm talking about with that occupancy address, because we've gotten this, this has come up in training sessions before, because they want to make use of this field. And the challenge is, come on, come on. There we go. Okay. So it went, what I, where I went was incidents. I went to the advanced search tab, and it's, I'm zoomed in, so that's why it's clipped there. And then the one field that throws people is right here, occupancy. So in order for you to get results, even if you got the right address, okay, you put the address in, but if you didn't select the use occupancy address, when you run a search, it's looking for every time so I can select our trail house whoops I'm going to zoom in so it made a okay so it's looking for every time I selected Archer Ale House. So those were the incidents that I did that on, but I bet you if I went to that address, and the address has changed multiple times for training, but just pretend it was at 851 Coho Way. If I put in a search for that address, it would come up more times because I put the address in, but I didn't select use occupancy address. I just want you guys to be clear on that one because it throws people for a loop sometimes. So I hope that makes sense. Alan, anything you want to add on that one? No, I don't think so. Uh... It just that's definitely a good way to uh, have some good documentation of how many times you've been to a certain occupancy if you're having issues with them. So 
and the and that is that's very true. And then if you need to back it up, you can do a double. You can do two searches: one from the occupancy, and then one from the address to confirm that they either match or one is more than the other. Because it will still, even if you select use occupancy address, when you run a filter back here for just that address, it, those same incidents will also come up because it's just looking then at the address field. So I hope that makes sense and is a little bit helpful. Is it a new feature with the system? No, but it's kind of a confusing one, especially when you go here to, to the search for an occupancy. And you got to think the different database tables. How else would it know that it's that occupancy if you didn't select it within the incident report itself on page three there? Okay, Michael Bazzani's got a good comment here. We're going to get to that momentarily, so thanks, Mike. We'll, uh, I'll open up your mic, and I'll have you walk them through it. Um, I know what you're talking about, but I want you to be able to explain it to them. Okay, the other thing for those of you going on to Nemesis 3 is you've got this required field for Nemesis property classification, and if you want to have a happy day, this makes this is the required, this is the list of the Nemesis property classifications. It is a, it's a long list, there's not even a scroll bar, so I have, I mean, I, it does eventually end, but it's not fun. And so we tried to make it easier for you. So when you type in a 419 for the end first type, the database tables link and go, okay, we're gonna match 419 with this one. So we're firefighters, at the end of the day, we're all firefighters, and if there's less data entry we can do, it's a good day. And so we try to save you some time. Triple Eight's fire station. So Triple Eight's a fire station, public administration building, as a place of occurrence of the external cost. And I know a question out there is going to be, well, if it's a not an EMS report, why is this red? And so it is red. And I'll, oh, don't do that to me. It is red. and this will confirm it. It's red regardless, that's what I thought. Okay, so it's gonna be red regardless um, for Enfer's validation. Um, I think it's just the way it was coded, but the nice thing is, and I just wanna mention it to you because it's gonna get auto-filled and it is not a big deal as far as the field goes, but some states for NEMSIS reporting require this, so we just take the pain out of remembering whether it's gonna be required or not and just make it required for every incident and just know what you put in the property use, because we know those pretty well. And oddly enough, if there's numerical values which there may be associated with all of these, they're not on this list. And so you could do a you know, keyword search bedroom and other specified residential institution, but I think we just assume let it do it for you here. And so that doesn't mean, however, that what gets auto-populated isn't something else that you need to change, and this gives you the ability to change it. Um, David Richardson, you got you already, um, and hey, David, welcome. David, I got to mention, guys, he is uh, out at Midwest City, um, former ISO auditor, also a great public speaker. He was uh, talked about ISO at our National Training Academy, and um, longtime user of emergency reporting and just really knows the system well, and then combine that with his ISO expertise, and he's just unstoppable. So um, his question was, is there a report for the number of incidents at a specific occupancy? And he says, never mind, I found it. It's incident number 1331. Any questions? And Mike, don't let me forget to come back to you on yours with the narratives because we're going to go back to the narratives here. Any questions at all, guys, on basic three? All right, seeing none, we'll go to basic four. Now, the only thing I want to really mention here that you're going to see that new, especially as you get if you move over to Nemesis 3, is you've got these three times that didn't used to be here. Okay, PSAP dispatch notified an incident responder arrived on scene. These are all Nemesis 3 fields, um, and I won't even bore, bore you with the XML schema and all that. But suffice it to say that under EMS times, you can see here PSAP call date, dispatch notified. Okay, unit notified. That's 
why we added, oops, that's why we added it here in order for Nemesis 3 compliance. They are not required fields, um, but they are recommended fields. And that's really the only unique new thing here in Enforce 4, Basic 4. Basic 5, a few things here that you guys need to be aware of. Okay, first and foremost, here's that aid given, right? I gave aid. So what would happen is if I were agency friends with another department, their incidents, there are no mutual aid incidents among your listed friends for the selected incident date. So the key is, is not only does it have to be an agency friend here, they also have had to have selected aid received. The incident report doesn't have to be completed, I found out, but it does have to be aid received to pop up on this list. And then you click once, and it will then fill these three fields for you. So here's the good news. Then I'll give you the bad news. The good news is the FDID, if you're doing things smart in your neighboring agencies, you can say, oh, the next door FD, we gave them aid, put in parentheses their FDID, that's done, state's done, then you, the bad news is you just got to get their incident number. Now, one question we get frequently asked is, well, what if I need to get this report done and submit to Enfers, and I'm still waiting for that other agency to get me their incident number? So, in, in order to be Enfers compliant and for them to truly link your call with their call in the Enfers database, you got to have the right incident number. However, I have heard, I won't advocate for this, but I have heard other agencies just putting in a multi-digit number here and calling it good. I'm not saying that's the best practice, um, but that's what people have told me they do in order to get the report done. It's always better to get the right number here for data collection. Okay, so the neighboring agencies involved is a relatively new feature, and it's an example of where our system has moved forward and the reports have to catch up. We do not have a report yet that pulls from this one, um, but it's a really good one to have, um, and I strongly recommend you take advantage of it. Okay, and that's going to be over here in admin, so I popped over to admin. And go to drop-downs. Last one, neighboring agencies list. This is where you can add a new agency, and I really recommend you get a lot to choose from. Make, take advantage of it because you can, once we get the report in the system, you'll be able to see, well, how often did we run with PD? How often did we run with uh, uh, the utility gas company? Maybe we have an opportunity for training, and now we can back it up with data. Hey, we ran with you guys on, you know, 10, you know, power outage calls or lightning strikes. You guys came out. Let's do some training together, and this can document that. Put the agency name in there. Okay, so... And then also put their, oops, put their FDID in there in parentheses and still put it here because what this field will do eventually is allow you to pull a report by FDID, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't display back on this page without putting it next to the, the name. And that's what, what we want is that FDID so we can fill this field out when we give aid. Okay. And we select type, add agency, close that, refresh the page, and there's Phoenix Fire. And one thing I didn't do is click save. So that's why that disappeared. Okay, now all my required fields are filled in. So what's the difference between this one and this one? Because it's like, well, why am I doing this if I'm doing this? The whole goal to me is if I'm putting something in, there should be a way for me to get the data out so it can be useful. Okay? And so right now, and I'm going to ask Mike and, and uh, Alan if they know of any others, but as far as I know, the only report where this comes into play is... Report number 1677, it is a multi-picker called Agencies on Scene. This list matches this list. So if you check these boxes, this is a filter on this report. 
So Mike or Alan, do you know if this appears anywhere else? Because I have not seen it. Yeah, I don't I don't know of any other ones. It's the only one I know of. So stand by because we've got a Luke. Um, you guys may have worked with Luke. He's also works on our support team, but he is now um, a rep the reports product owner, and I've worked with him over the past couple of days, and he's killing it out there with reports. And so he knows that there's a need for a report that pulls from neighboring agencies. So it'll be coming. So hang tight and teach your guys. Build this list up to high quality uh, for your agency and teach the guys to check those boxes because then you can extract the data out later on. Okay, thanks, Mike. I saw your response there. Okay, that's page five. And we're going to do a quick tour, quick detour back here to the narrative because Mike's got a comment he'd like to add. Hang on, Mike. I'm going to open up your mic, bud. Okay, Mike. You're unmuted. You might have to unmute yourself. So um, in, the in the question that you sent out, go ahead and explain um, and walk me through what you want me to show them. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure that they were aware of, um, if you do choose to do the, the third option, you're going to make uh, one non-CAD narrative and not choose the middle option of making a narrative required for every apparatus. In the instance of my department, um, there is times that we require, if it is a multi-company response, say the first arriving en engine is going to put their narrative in, however the command officer is also required to put a narrative in, so whether it's the second arriving engine or whether it's battalion chief. So with that being said, you have to take a minute to either not complete the report once you add your narrative or wait till both narratives are added. So otherwise, if you were to add your one narrative in, go complete the report, and then say the next person has to come in and add their narrative, you would then have to go back and have an administrator go back and mark the report incomplete, and then add the narrative, and then recomplete it. Excellent that's point. Okay. No, no, stay on the line. That's good. Um, excellent point. So um, what Mike's saying is that if I'm the captain and I complete my report, but I needed Alan to do his report and being on the medic, medic truck, and I go to complete it, and Alan does not have, for now, we're going to call it a submitter privileges, but we're going in better and in, in more granular permissions. But for now, Alan has submitter privileges. Once I've completed that report, he can't unlock it and go in and add his narrative. So it's incumbent upon me to keep it incomplete until he finishes his narrative. That's, is that what you wanted to make clear, Mike? Yep, exactly. So good, good point. Yep, real good point because, again, it's agency-specific on how they do the QA on this. We just give you some tools. Um, and maybe in Mike's case, you don't need an, a narrative for each apparatus, but you certainly need one for the IC plus the first due unit. And so that's a good example of where internal QA needs to take place. Great point. Outstanding. Okay. So I have just a little bit uh, to go here in the ePCR that I want to bring up to you guys. But before we do that, let's see any questions that we have not asked or answered yet. Todd goes, okay, Todd uh, says, I would like the option to change the author name if the person providing the narrative doesn't have access to ER. So does that mean that if they didn't have access to ER, someone else was a proxy and put that narrative in for them? Maybe you can elaborate a little further. Yes, okay, that's a, that's a proxy. Okay, so what he's saying... And that's a toughie. So the only thing, because this is locked down for me right now, and it could be because I'm in Safari, it could have a little wonky, wonky behavior here. So what Todd's asking is that, that say he puts in Todd, puts in that narrative, but it's, he's filling it in as a proxy for someone else um, that either narrated it to him or you know he's transcribing it to be able to change that. So going with Paul's suggestion earlier, in the interim, um, not knowing if that will ever become a feature, but certainly you have that, and I would do it in the first part. Um, I don't know if it's a dictation, but let's say narrative transcribed from, whoops, from Chief Smith. So when I do that, 
at least the narrative, the very first sentence that appears in the grid will appear like this. So it's kind of a workaround, but um, I think it could, would kind of work. So yeah, his example, I enter the narrative for personnel that, oh, got it, okay. So in other words, in his department, he has some people that um, don't have access to be able to enter incidents, and he's doing the incident for, incident narrative part for them. So yeah, in that case, you know, from Firefighter Smith, I would, I would start it like this, going with Paul's suggestion earlier, and that way it's still going to show you, Todd, but at least you can say the, where you obtain that, and anybody who sees this will see it right out of the gate. Great point. Okay, EMS. So a couple things here on the EPCR that I want to mention to you guys that I just learned, and it's nothing new and fancy in the system, but it is something that if someone hadn't taught me this, I would never have figured it out probably on my own. So I'm working with one of our reps. Um, you guys may know him if you're in Texas or Oklahoma, Billy. Craft. And so we're here in patient care, and Nemesis 3 has what's called pertinent negative values. In other words, okay, it allows you the documentation of a pertinent negative, which means in this case, and I'll just cite the example that they have. So if you're supposed to give aspirin, but the patient's on blood thinners and you can't give it to them, or they just took aspirin, typical chest pain call, they just downed 325 milligrams of aspirin. Your protocol said for chest pain, we got to give them 325. 481 milligram tablets, you can put in here medication already taken. And so we're working through that. It's like, well, how do we do that in emergency reporting? Okay. Well, good. The, we thought, uh-oh, we weren't doing it right. And actually, thankfully, we are. So let me close these windows out. So what I want to show you for both procedures and medication for right now, we'll go medication. So administered prior to this, so let's do the chip, classic chest pain call. We get dispatched and they've already down the aspirin 10 minutes prior to our arrival. So we're going to go, yes. Um, we're going to go now, but it was really 10 minutes prior to our arrival and administered by. So it's going to give you a list of all your personnel. Well, that's not going to work. Okay, so we're going to go non applicable here because nobody on our crew or nursing staff, whomever, gave it. Okay, not a required field, so maybe we don't know, and there's certainly no, there is, disregard, layperson. And then no authorization, there's only the four, so we don't have to select any. Um, you could put on scene that they did it beforehand, it's up to you and your agency how they want to document it. But here we go, here's the challenge. So aspirin, but we didn't administer it, they did. Down at the very bottom, so if you click through, you've got your medication list, and you click to the end, scroll all the way down to the bottom, these are your pertinent negatives. So if I were to show you, look at that list real quick here, contrication indicated, noted, denied by order, that list, if I go here to medications, and I go to... Medication given, these are my pertinent negatives here. Contraindication noted, that same list is at the bottom of our medications list, and I can check, if I try to check two medications, I can't. I can only check one. However, our developers, it, this works, it's just not obvious. So I want to say medication already taken. I can check both those, medication and a, and a pertinent negative. So our thinking is, in revamping this, is to just have a separate item here called pertinent negative and have this list isolated out of the meds list. But in the meantime, both for medication and for procedures, just remember if someone asks you, okay, they gave it to the patient, you know, this was done on scene or the patient's allergic to it, we can't give it, um, or in this case, in the procedure, okay, there was a contraindication noted. You can select the contraindication and the actual procedure itself. So just know it's, I wish there was a better way to explain it or something more obvious, but just know that your contraindications are embedded in the drop down list with, in this case, both procedures and medications.
and then you can double select there. Whereas I could not select more than one assessment, more than one procedure. You can see it changes. So I hope that helps. I wanted to pass that on to you all because I just learned it, um, and, and it was it all it all started when when a customer or a prospect asked one of our reps in the Texas and Oklahoma area, "What about pertinent negatives? How do you guys document that?" And so he did his homework, and then we worked together to go because we thought, "Oh, we don't do it," and then it's like, "Well, sure enough, we do." So I hope that's helpful to you. Does it come in all the time? Um, no, it's not frequent. But you know the one on aspirin is, is often is pretty frequent. At least it was in my jurisdiction where our chest pain calls. They know they're taking that aspirin before we get there. Okay. The other thing that Alan went through that I just want to mention to you here is our new progress meter down on the summary bar. Let me zoom back in. When you get to the summary, it's going to show you that the EPCR is in progress, it's been authorized, ready to submit, submitted, depending on the response, and then fully authorized. And so take a second, and again, we're running, we've got just a little bit of time left, um, just mouse over each one of these to get a good explanation, and if you need a, a deeper review of this, um, check out Alan's uh, Virtual Thursday on completing an EPCR. I think that was the second one, if I remember correctly, wasn't it, Alan, of the three? Yeah, it was the second one. And then there's also the, the knowledge base article has been posted as well. Yeah, and it's actually a, a really awesome knowledge base article. I have to brag about it because Alan did a really good job. So, um, <laughs> so Alan put this sucker together and it's just top notch. So it'll walk you through it. In fact, I'm going to put that link in here, guys. And again, this is Nemesis 3, so if you're still hanging tight on Oh, by the way, here's the link to Orlando. If you want to come to training there, here's the link to the Progress Bar Knowledge Base article. And please, if you ever see anything in our, in our Knowledge Base articles that need updating, just ping us. Just send it to training at emergencyreporting.com, and uh, we'll update it because we've been we've been on kind of an ongoing process of going through all of our knowledge base articles and making sure they're keeping up with all the changes in the system. Okay, and last but not least, when it comes to the EPCR, there's a report in the system that I think you'll find valuable. When you're submitting to the state, and I may have to toggle over to Alan's account only because this is a demo. Alan, what's your AID? I'm going to go there. Oh, they took down, you're right, Andy, they took down your photo. That's a, there must be doing some rotating photos here, but Andy was on earlier, so this is a group that uh, we're at our headquarters in uh, Bellingham during the National Training Academy. Take this quick survey, too, to let us know how we can help, um, better serve you for the next one uh, in 2018. Um, Hope my audio didn't cut out. Alan, you still there? Alan's audio might have cut out. You guys still able to hear me okay? Just do a quick yes. Oh, no, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just crazy and I had myself muted. Um, the RAID is 1549. Okay, so I want to show you guys a, a live account with a report with that report. Say it one more time. 15. 1549. Okay, so check this report out. It's always more meaningful when it's live data versus training data. That's why I wanted to run it. So it's report number 1704, NEMSIS 3 State Validation Report. So I want to see all statuses, and we'll do November. That's good because it's only a couple days. And these are their EPCRs and the status of the PCRs. So this is the report to go to. So these are their incident numbers, date, incident number, PCR number, if there is one, and whether or not if a successfully submitted and accepted by the state. And don't forget, at the bottom of each report that we have, most of our reports, and that's one of the goals is to make sure every report has this, there's a summary of what this report is, the, the parameters it's pulling from in the system, and, worth, and, and what it's showing you. So only incidents that are reviewed are provided, 
incidents with no patients will show up when, uh, when selecting it, all statuses. Okay, and then it talks about the submission levels, new, in progress, invalid submission, wait, they're being processed, and retry, failure or success. So you can see they're having very, very good success so far in these first two days of November in getting the reports submitted. So what I should be seeing when I run an all statuses is that every time there's a PCR, I should see success here. At least within, you know, 15, 20 minutes of submitting the report. Matt had a question here about when do we think Nemesis 3 will be rolled out for Arizona customers. You might have some insight on that, Tom. Yeah, yeah, Matt. Um, so Arizona is, of course, accepting Nemesis 3 now and Nemesis 3 only. Um, we're close. Um, what happens is with each state, it's not like NFIRST where it's one national, true national standard. Nemesis allows each state to add, piggyback things on, different fields, different parameters. So we essentially have to write 50 different code sets, so sort to of speak, or supplements to the code to be compliant for each state, but we're almost there with Arizona, and I'm, you know, we're my state, so I'm advocating for it. Uh, and one of the things, too, at least it used to be that it doesn't have to be 100% compliant, it's just as long as you hit a certain threshold of like 80 or 90% compliance as far as the quality of the report, and when I say quality, it's not the quality of the report writer and the quality of the narrative, it's the quality of the data points being accepted. Uh, once that threshold is reached, you're good to go. So we're almost there for Arizona. It's coming. And I don't have an exact date. I don't want to promise you an exact date. But I can say that the poor product owner for Nemesis 3, she is uh, deep into this as, as states are coming online so we can be compliant. And looks like, Chris, you um, already had your question answered about the getting to the pertinent negatives chart. You got that answered okay, it looks like. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, that it's almost top of the hour, so it's perfect timing. Um, Mike, uh, Alan, and I will be here for any questions that you have, or if there's anything you need me to go back to on what we went over today. Um, again, today's topic was covering the new multiple narratives. Oh, yeah, I didn't log out of Alan's account there. So going into the narratives and being able to do unit narratives for each apparatus. Sorry guys, I'm talking as I'm typing. I can't multitask like I I can do I can multitask, but then I can only do a few things mediocre. Okay, so just a quick review. New narrative the ability to add an, a narrative for each apparatus, all right, title each narrative, and then you've got the little WYSIWYG here for um, doing some uh, text formatting and adding bullets. Simple, but it's definitely something people wanted. We went over the, um, some nuances and important considerations in the basic module here, one through five including the aid given and received, selecting uh, patient uh, care is required for, PCR is required for this uh, incident, the use of, in this case we used it, use of the incident uh, occupancy address and facility address to autofill these fields and how it's linked back to the advanced search, when you check the occupancy box on the advanced search. The NEMSIS property classification, how it's a kind of an unwieldy list, but as long as you know your property use code, we've coded it to where it auto-populates this for you, and in almost every case I've seen, it works just fine. And it certainly takes care of that required field for NEMSIS. Page four was just three new Nemesis 3 fields uh, for incident date and times. Basic five, we covered how to build your neighboring agencies involved list, knowing that we got a report coming, so don't wait for the report, start using it now. And then we know that only, that I know of, 
unless somebody else um, participating knows of it. I think the only report that draws from these check boxes here is report 1677 in the form of a drop down list. And then we went into the EPCR, talked a little bit about pertinent negatives and how to document that in the event that you run into it. And we do run into it, whether we know it's called a pertinent negative or not, uh, we do run into it um, under medications and procedures. And I know it's in one or two other areas, but those are the two we were working in. The new progress meter. So when you get down to the summary, it gives you a progress meter as to the status of your EPCR, which is a real nice touch. We know that report 1704 pulls from the NEMSIS 3 and gives you a validation report. So you can see if you've got any issues with any of the reports being submitted to the state. And we answered a bunch of questions. Yeah, Tom, Mike had a good question about the apparatus times starting to show up in the uh, response and crew tab of the PCR. Let's go over there real quick. So I know Paul has a question too. If you guys want to take a look at Paul's question, we can answer that. Um, okay, Mike, yeah, Mike from Hiawatha. Um, Mike was out at um, our Cleveland uh, Regional Training Academy. So let me get out of your account because it's still showing me here. Okay, so in the EMS EPCR, on the response crew tabs. So guys, over on this side, we call these, the, our development team calls these buttons panels, and then within each panel is a section that can be expanded and collapsed. So if I'm following Mike correctly, we are over here in apparatus time. So what he's saying is that apparatus times have started showing up this morning here, and of course, this is probably a demo call, a mock call, so it doesn't have, no, it does have times, E3. Oh, this is, if, scroll down, Tom, on the... I'm sorry. Panel. I'm looking in the wrong. Here on the EPCR? Yeah, and the response and crew panel, if you scroll down. Okay. Keep going there. There we go. And that's new. So here's what I think is happening. Great, great call. And I wonder if that was deployed on Tuesday. Um, I believe it was, and I, I read that, and I do not know why it was deployed. So here's why I think it's deployed. Um, I think these these fields are going out with the NFERS, N, not NFERS, the NEMSIS export. So all these times okay. are going to go out with the NEMSIS export. That's what I think. I could be wrong. Um, because this is information that NEMSIS wants and it's another way to get it out. So you can see it's auto-populating, okay, and it allows you to enter additional fields for the NEMSIS 3 report. So maybe you don't enter it in, in basic 4, but you need it here in the apparatus for the actual PCR, you can enter it here. I will double check into that, very great catch. Um, and I believe, did you notice it before Tuesday, um, Alan? Um, I have not, but I honestly I have not been on the medic lately. Our lieutenant dislocated his shoulder, so I've been on or been riding up on the engine. So I'm not okay. sure. Yeah, we'll check it out. We'll check it out, Mike. Let me um, hang on. Let me make a note so I don't forget to do that. And there may be an, the system changes so rapidly. Apparatus times and EPCR. Okay, cool. That's why I wasn't looking in the right spot because I didn't know it was there either. So that's good. That's my guess is its ability to do independent times separate from basic four here for ENFERS and to capture times that may or may not be needed for NEMSIS 3 for your agency. That's my thinking. Okay, Chris, very good. Uh, you're welcome. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Um, and I'll follow, yeah. up with you. I'll follow up with you, Mike, once I get an answer on that one, uh, a definitive answer on it. Um, Paul Wynn, so if an admin goes in, and changes the user's narrative without notification or permission, it could or will it impede on further investigations? Can we find a way to identify 
the change in the authorized screen. So what should be happening, so if I get it, is someone goes in an admin and changes someone's narrative, will it document that those changes took place? So in, in the event that there were an investigation, you could track that down and identify the culprit? Is that what you're asking, Paul? I just want to make sure I'm getting the question right. Okay, cool. Yep, got it. Okay, so I know historically, and I don't want to tell you that the answer is definitely yes here because I don't know if it's behaving this way with our new narrative. If you go to history details in the past, under history details it shows you the changes to the narrative. Now the thing currently is that it will show changes to the so watch, it'll show changes to the, it, it would have shown changes to the old Enfer's narrative. So if I add a narrative, and this is a good test. I go in, make a change, Alan goes in, makes a change. Historically, when we were to go to that incident, go to that incident history details, it would show those changes. And so what this is telling me, and I could be wrong, but what it's telling me is that it's not tracking it like it used to under the old narrative uh, format. And so that's an opportunity for us here, I think, to, uh, to see what, that. What, what incident number was that, Tom? I think it's showing narrative changes. It's just not showing the actual changes, changes, if that makes it shows, sense. It shows you who did it, but it's not showing you what was changed. Right, which is the way that things changed with the new um, narratives PCR as well. Yeah. So it's showing that, that, that information is stored somewhere, but it's just not showing in the exposure history details, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, Paul, you could at least go in and see who did it. You just can't necessarily see what they changed. All right, I hope that helps, but that is also, I'll take a screenshot of that too, because I think, especially for agencies that need to track this, I can just at least, and I know they're aware of this, but at least we can say it was mentioned during our virtual Thursday training today. All right, so we're going to wrap it up. Guys that stayed past the top of the hour, thank you. I know your time is very valuable and you're all busy um, with your job, so thank you for spending time with us today. This recording will be posted. Uh, my goal is to have it posted by Monday morning, so hopefully I'll be able to meet that goal for you. So in the event you wanted to review it, um, it'll be up on our webinars on demand via the knowledge base. Uh, Mike, thanks for helping out. Alan, Alan, as always, appreciate you having me or having you on with me. <laughs> and uh, anything you guys would like to add? No, I think that's uh, some great questions and uh, yes, great input from everybody. Yeah, it's terrific. Let's see, we got one that popped up here. Yep, uh, Matt and Paul, you're very, very welcome, guys. Uh, Mike, you're welcome, and uh, glad to help you guys out with this today. And if you find anything you have questions on, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And probably the best way is just some, keep it simple. You can, if those of you that have my uh, email, certainly send it out and uh, to me directly at Tom at emergencyreporting.com or even just training at emergencyreporting.com, and one of the training team members will pick that up for you and get it answered. All right, everybody, stay safe. Have a wonderful rest of the week and a terrific weekend. And uh, we'll see you again in a couple weeks. And uh, thanks again, Alan and Mike. Sure appreciate it. Yep, thank you. Thank, take care.